Hello everyone. My name is Gajendra Das Sharma and you are watching English. And in this video, we are going to explain 25 important phrases in the plays of Shakespeare. We'll also tell the important facts about these phrases as to where they occurred and who spoke those lines. These are oft quoted phrases and are spoken in colloquial languages. And as such, they are very important from the examination point of view, particularly for upcoming examination of PGT and TGT. So let's start the video. The very first phrase is from smoke into the smother. This occurred in as you like it. In act 1 scene 2. And the line was spoken by Orlando. The clear meaning of this line is out of the frying pan into the fire. That is to say from bad to worse. Just like we can say in Hindi Asman se tapke khajur pa latke. So here this expression from smoke into smother is used in colloquial language to mean something bad to worse. So when you escape smoke and this fall into smother, smother means suffocating smoke. When smoke suffocates you, so from smoke into smother. Second phrase is hold or cut your broastings. This was used in a midsummer night stream. And this was the last line of Act 1. Actually, Nick Bottom was discussing with other fellow beings about the performance. So he says this, Nick Bottom, when he was discussing about the performance of the play, they had to or they were going to perform. So it clearly means when you feel, realize that there is enough talking, either you had to go with what we have to go or simply abandon the plan, the whole thing. So you say, hold or cut your broastings. Either execute the plan conceived or you abandon or give up the plan itself. It is no use talking and talking and discussing. There is a limit of discussion and then after discussion it is a matter of execution. If you are not able to execute, so certainly or simply you abandon, you give up the plan. So there in this kind of situation this phrase is used. When there is enough talking, so you have to go with what you have got or simply abandon the whole thing. So either do it or give up. Meanwhile, let me tell you that an academy brings out to you a specially curated marathon series in which the top educators will be covering important topics of their subjects and give understanding on tips and tricks to crack NTA UGC examination. You can get benefited by enrolling yourself right now by the link that is given in the description box below. Moreover, an academy is excited to announce that it is presenting you an exclusive interview with 100 percentile Jyoti Gupta. Here in this class, the educator Navdeep Kaur will interview Jyoti Gupta and discuss tips and strategy to get 100 percentile learners at any stage of their preparation and how they will be benefited from the course. So in order to have this kind of experience, enroll yourself by the link that is given in the description box below. Next phrase is like a boar in a frank. It is a proverb and it was used in Henry IV part 2. And the line was spoken or the phrase was spoken by young Prince Harry. Actually boar is referred to Falstaff and frank is pig sty. When Falstaff was stuffing food, rather he, we can say he was not eating the food, he was stuffing it. So young Prince Harry commented or criticized his gluttony. Prince was not pleased with the way John Falstaff was eating the food. So when any person eats something gluttonously or voraciously without the respect of the host or the fellow wings, you go to some person's place and then you start eating very voraciously or gluttonously and you don't show any respect to the host or the respect of your fellow beings. You stuff the food. So at that situation, it is like a boar in a frank. Just like a pig eats its food in a pig sty without the respect of the fellow pigs. The same situation is applied when someone eats gluttonously without showing any respect to either host or the fellow beings. So it clearly means to eat voraciously or gluttonously or without showing any respect to the host or fellow beings. The next is a proverb, man shuts their door against the setting sun. It appeared in Timon of Athens and the lines are directed or addressed to Timon himself. One of his friends, he comments on his 
spent thrift habit when timon had everything he spent lavishly on his friends so one of his friends or benefactors suggests him that he should start he should behave moderately he should spend moderately and he should know who is the friend and who is not because time can be any time against him and it is the tendency of human beings to shut their doors even against the setting sun when the sun sets nobody wants to hail it welcome it at the close of the day we rather prefer to shut our doors so metaphorically it is suggested when the adversity comes all the people they they escape the presence of any person they try to avoid the person so timon should behave in that manner he should start he should spend accordingly rather than lavishly because when he will be left with nothing all his friends will not be there with him to support him to ask how he is doing so better to prepare for that adverse time if at all it comes so he is being not only addressed he is being warned warned against all his friends whom he lavishly spends because they will leave him as such next phrase is an old cloak makes a new jerkin this is taken from mary wives of windsor and it is primarily taken from or modified from the english proverb old brass will make a new pen so by this proverb shakespeare modified and this expression and said old cloak makes a new jerkin and here it was stated by john falstaff so something seemingly old and worn out can always be rejuvenated or energized when it is applied in the same new and more interesting ways he tries to suggest when something seemingly old and worn out can always be rejuvenated or energized when it is applied in some new or more interesting way so it is just like to give a new life to the old thing by improvising it a kind of makeover it is always a good practice to give a new life to the old existing thing if you do something creative to it if you infuse life to it by making it look quite different and finding all the good qualities exploiting all the good qualities into something new something better something more creative something more interesting at this kind of situation this phrase is used next phrase is small birds must have meat this is an english proverb and that is inspired by shakespeare the actual proverb by shakespeare was young ravens must have food so from this quote it has been modified as such which is in currency young birds must have food and this was used by shakespeare in mary wives of windsor and here in this play it was spoken by pistol pistol was one of the friends of falstaff the clear meaning is that smallest of us cannot be maintained with nothing so we need something even the little ones they need something to support to exist smallest of us cannot be maintained with nothing every creature whether big or small has its own needs which cannot be ignored where there is an existence of any creature we have to provide we have to make provision for it so when we talk about the needs of everyone the smallest one or the young ones cannot be ignored they have their needs as well next phrase is recover the wind it was used in hamlet and spoken by hamlet as well the implied meaning is to get the better of the better of something that is to improvise actually when hamlet wanted to catch the conscience of his uncle he discussed this with his friends rosen crantz and gailen stern he was discussing about the use of a mouse trap he wanted to recover the wind that is to say he wanted to catch the guilty conscience of his uncle there he spoke this this phrase next phrase is a triton among the minnows this was used in coriolanus it is a kind of byword for an important person surrounded by inferiors or we can simply say a big fish in a small pond in hindi we can call andho mein kana raja so a person seems to be of importance when it is surrounded by the less important person his only quality is that he is the better one among the worse ones so when someone only seems impressive because they are surrounded by inferiors 
rather than someone who appears to lead or to have outgrown their surroundings so here we are not talking about the leaders or the person of great qualities here we are considering the person who has little bit qualities but he is surrounded by the people of no qualities at all so among those fools the person seems to be wise one and it has its ancient origin triton in the classical mythology was the son of sea god poseidon and amphitrite triton was not as capable or as important and great as his father sea god poseidon but still he was capable of roaring waves or creating small storms so he was considered to have some kind of worth because the ones he was surrounded by were good for nothing so it is a phrase for all those who are surrounded by the less capable or the fools and you seem to have some kind of guts some kind of qualities the next phrase is two hours traffic of the stage it alludes to the life story of people if life is a stage so the life that is shown on the stage is worth two hours and it is a kind of traffic he remains in hodgepodge and hustle and bustle and after playing his part in that chaotic situation he departs so it was used in the prologue of romeo and juliet and is spoken by chorus when the chorus came and threw the light on the on the plot of the play so it is merely a 2 hours traffic on the stage which will show the life in its all manifestations broadly speaking it is it alludes to the life of common people so the phrase is 2 hours traffic of the stage that alludes to the lifespan of human beings our existence is merely a 2 hours traffic of the stage we come play our part become the part of the chaos become the part of the hustle bustle toxic turvy condition of our life and after playing various roles we depart from here next phrase is what is past is prologue it was used in the play the tempest in act second scene first and this line was spoken by antonio it means that history sets context for the present in simple terms we can say history repeats itself so we find in our life many situations we repeat themselves like the childhood of the father so is the childhood of the son whatever a person does in his life he gets the same reflection from his progeny from his coming generation or whatever or whatever situation our forefathers faced we are repeating the same kind of things with the little alteration so what is past is simply a prologue is an introduction we cannot bury our past simple thing is that we can we cannot bury our past our past will be reflected before us in some or other way interestingly this was the title of the star star trek title of one of the episode star trek series star trek tv series what is past is a prologue next phrase is the caterpillars of the commonwealth this occurred in richard ii in act 2 scene 3 and it was spoken by henry bolingbroke and the phrase refers to all the corrupt people all the politicians who misuse the very concept of democracy they are just like caterpillars a caterpillar so when it mounts on some kind of leaf leaves it with nothing eats it completely and the leaf is left with nothing so just like a caterpillar when it enters the field devours everything eats everything destroys everything in the same way the corrupt politicians they misuse the concept of democracy and then they they destroy the very foundation the core belief the core principle of democracy they rather misuse it misuse the very concept the ideals of democracy so these people are just like caterpillars of the commonwealth the phrase is for these people next phrase is eating the bitter bread of banishment it also occurred in richard ii and it was spoken to by henry bolingbroke and it occurred in act 3 scene 1 the line has the figure of speech as well alliteration and it is the it refers to the severe punishment of exile when somebody is exiled somebody is banished he suffers severe punishment just like we say kala pani ki saza so he is supposed to face bitter bread of banishment he is supposed to eat 
bitter bread of banishment so the phrase can be used for such situation when the person is banished exiled and is severely punished there so we can say that the person is eating the bitter bread of banishment next phrase is patch grief through proverbs this phrase occurred in much ado about nothing and it occurred in act 5 scene 1 and was spoken by leonetto it is simply to console console ourselves with philosophy various sayings and proverbs and statements of great people and quotations of the great figures they console us in the time of our grief when we are surrounded by some kind of grief some kind of sorrow some kind of loss so we can compensate this grief we can slightly patch up this grief with proverbs the philosophical lines and quotations they mitigate our suffering to certain extent we try to rationalize the the grief the sorrow thinking it to be one of the indispensable aspects of our existence rationalize it and then we move on so whenever we we try to rationalize ourselves in the time of grief with proverbs and philosophy we can use this phrase you have to simply patch grief through proverbs or you can patch your grief through proverbs now the next phrase or rather it is a kind of quotation or proverb the miserable have no other medicine but only hope hope is the only medicine of the poor the miserable the rich the affluent the capable they can get anything they can afford anything they can have anything they can have all the favors of everyone everything but the miserable the poor the underdogs they have only one hope and with the hope they keep on lingering dragging their existence supposing that some day or other day the hope will turn out to be positive for them the things will turn out to be positive for them so in that hope they keep on living and as such they live their life unfortunately sometimes they they depart from this world without realizing their hope this is the sad reality of the life so here this line was spoken in measure for measure and claudio spoke these lines to to duke vincentio in act 3 scene 1 next line is or next phrase is the attempt not the deed confounds us this was used by lady macbeth in macbeth and they were addressed to macbeth even act 2 scene 2 here she is trying to instigate or instill courage in macbeth by saying that if you are trying something and not executing so your destruction will be quite near merely attempting will not do the attempt has to be carried out the effort has to be carried out into execution so when we fail in most of the situation is or most of the conditions is it uh, the attempt was not realized the attempt was not carried out the attempt was not converted into the deed the task the execution and that's why some people they are confounded destroyed so confound means to destroy so here she is trying to instill courage in macbeth that he has to carry out all his attempts he has to finalize or materialize rather he has to materialize his attempts into the accomplished deed because if you merely attempt and not accomplish that attempt or endeavor into the final deed task so you will be confounded you will surely be defeated so the defeat does not come by the act rather by the unfulfilled attempt or half hearted attempt so here she is trying to avoid half hearted attempt next phrase or idiom is a man more sinned against than sinning this famous quotation occurred in king lear in act 3 and it was spoken by lear himself and addressed to kent he is talking about his fate on fate that he is more sinned against than sinning the extent of his suffering is more than what he has done so sometimes or it happens with many of the people they suffer more than their due they must have committed some crime some sin but it was not so severe not so heinous not so complicated not so complex that they are suffering for it 
देयर सफरिंग इज मोर द पनिशमेंट इज मोर सीवियर देन दे वर एक्सपेक्टेड टू इट और देन दे डिजर्व इट दिस इज द काइंड ऑफ इल प्रोपोर्शन ऑफ द पनिशमेंट और द जजमेंट मैनी टाइम्स द जजमेंट इज नॉट प्रोपोर्शनेट द पीपल हु डू मोर हार्म और मोर सिनफुल एक्ट दे स्केप द पनिशमेंट एंड द पीपल हु आर फ्रेम्ड हु ओनली डिड स्लाइट मिस्टेक्स स्लाइट क्राइम्स tiny crimes they are framed in such a way that their whole life they keep on suffering king lear feels that the kind of sins or the crimes he has committed were not so severe in comparison of the severity of the punishment he is suffering so in this kind of situation you say that a man is more sinned against than sinning when he tries to do something else but his destiny plays some other game against him so sin sometimes prevails the deeds the good deeds of the people and he keeps on suffering this quotation is also from king lear come not between the dragon and his wrath they were spoken by lear himself king lear himself king lear to kent kent is the addressee and lear is the speaker in act 1 scene 1 king lear is very angry at the way cordelia has given him answer and kent is trying to rationalize his anger so lear warns him not to come between his anger this is very true with human beings as well when we are uh, very much angry at something so somebody who is trying to rationalize us or try to calm us is not responded as such we merely say you just go away go away otherwise you will be the stock of that anger you can suffer the side effect of that anger so it is always a wise thing not to come between a person an angry person and his anger try to avoid the company of that person who is very angry so the phrase is not to come between dragon and his wrath and his anger next is life is as tedious as a twice told tale occurred in king john and it was spoken by lewis to cardinal pendel in act 3 scene 4 here he is trying to say the philosophy of life life is just as boring as that there is only repetition of almost all the activities in our life the story of life is tedious it is tiring and it is as tired as a twice told tale you don't feel interested in any story which has been already told you cannot be pleased by the same story again and again but here we are facing this story again and again so life is one thing it is tedious and on the top of that it is twice told tale you can find the similar lines in macbeth where he says life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing next phrase is what in thy quips and quiddities it occurred in henry fourth part 1 in act 1 scene 2 and here it refers to the mood of falstaff and it was referred by prince henry so the phrase in thy or in your quips and quiddities means in your foolish mood or in your foolish joke or in the mood of foolish joke foolish or nonsensical jokes so whenever any person keeps on just cracking poor jokes or foolish jokes so we can refer to him that he is in his quips and quiddities so prince harry is trying to restrict the mood the joking mood of falstaff where he is foolishly or nonsensically cracking the jokes again and again when before you some person keeps on cracking poor jokes or foolish or nonsensical jokes so you can question him why or what in thy quips and quiddities next phrase is king of shreds and patches this occurred in hamlet act 3 scene 4 and hamlet is speaking to gertrude and the king here referred to claudius shreds and patches means a king a ragtag king ragtag king means a person who is very untidy disorganized shabbily dressed and as such his attributes are as shabby untidy and disorganized he is good for nothing and he is quite unworthy unworthy person so that kind of person can be referred to a king of shreds and patches one who is unwholesome unworthy undeserving candidate so hamlet refers to claudius as the king of shreds and patches 
in comparison to his own father who was the royal person so hamlet is trying to make gertrude realize why the hell she had to marry this kind of foolish or unworthy person claudius leaving her husband even after a very few days of his death she married she remarried so what was the haste and why was she in such a hurry to marry this kind of unworthy person had he been some kind of more deserving a royal more royal person there could have been some kind of justification since Ham claudius was nothing in comparison to the late king hamlet and still gertrude had to marry next phrase is but i am pigeon livered and lack gall to make the oppressors bitter so the phrase that is important is pigeon livered it is also said to be lily livered means very weak and coward and here hamlet is talking to himself hamlet in his soliloquy in act 2 scene 2 actually he is feeling guilty he is guilty ridden actually he has realized that he has come to know who is the culprit who is the murderer of his father he knows that his uncle was the same person and he has cause he has an objective he has reason for avenging himself upon however he is incapable he is not getting capable enough to take action so he feels that he is pigeon livered or lily livered or a kind of weak and coward person so whenever you come across any such kind of person you can call him a pigeon livered person this springes to catch woodcocks to catch woodcocks is the phrase of our purpose so here it refers to a trap for stupids or stupid birds when the stupid birds are ensnared and trapped so the phrase is used to say springes to catch woodcock so this occurred in hamlet in act 1 scene 3 it was said by polonius to ophelia next important phrase is a truant disposition this phrase is used to refer to a feeling of skipping the school every person has had this kind of feeling once or other in his lifetime so it refers to a kind of feeling when we wanted not to go to the school to bunk the classes because we took pleasure in that in doing that so when a feeling or an urge to bunk the classes bunk the school overpowers you you are supposed to have a truant disposition it occurred in hamlet in act 1 scene 2 meaning a feeling to skip the school to bunk the classes and here it was spoken by horatio to hamlet so the phrase can be used when we when we have a strong urge to bunk the classes or bunk the school next phrase is what is the city but the people this occurred in coriolanus in act 3 scene 1 and it was spoken by senius and he is talking to the people and he is in relation with the democracy democratic ideal he says that a city is nothing without the people but means except or without so there is no existence of any city without the people people make the city people make the place people make home otherwise it is merely a house it is merely a building if there are no people so the foundation of city is worthless the existence of city is worthless city can be alluded to the state the country country is known by its people country has its existence only with the existence of people so we cannot ignore the existence of people when we have to build our country no country can be built on the on the misfortune on the harm of the people all the ideals all the principles they are made for the people not against the people so this is the core belief of any democracy democracy means you have to consider the interest of the people in order to consider the existence of anything people's voice is the voice of god people's existence is the existence of god and the last phrase is the flowery way that leads to broad gate and the great fire this was used in all's well that ends well in act 4 scene 5 these lines were spoken by clown and addressed to left so that is all for now hopefully you enriched your vocabulary and your learning of william shakespeare with these 25 important phrases 
they will be quite helpful for the examinations like UPTGT, PGT and NTNET and other various examinations where English literature is asked. We will come back very soon with yet another video. Till then stay tuned, keep learning, stay motivated and like this video, share it among your friends and if you have not subscribed to this channel, don't forget to do it right now. Thanks for watching.